All right. So, uh, so let's get started. Um, so, you know, you all have your homework one back. Uh, the grades uh, are posted. Uh, I haven't yet, bless you, I haven't yet posted attendance grades because I was going to let those build a little bit. You know, like if we only had two days of class and you missed one, it's like, oh, I got a 50. No, you, you don't have to. It's just attendance grades, so, so it'll be all right. But one thing I will mention, you know, be sure to sign the attendance sheet, and that also kind of means be here on time. You know, I saw some folks even today coming in a few minutes late, and if the attendance sheet goes around and your name doesn't get on it, and then, uh, you know, uh, you forget to sign in, and it's like May, and you go, well, I was here every day. I don't know, you know, all I have is the attendance sheet and your name isn't on it. So just make sure that you get your name on the attendance sheet. Otherwise, I, I legitimately, I'm not going to remember whether you're here or not. So just make sure you're here on time. Uh, so homework one's been graded and returned. Uh, you all have that and the grades are posted. And don't forget homework two. Right now, you all should be able to do, I think, at least problems one through three. There's five problems on that assignment. After today, you will definitely be able to knock out uh, the rest of it. So uh, any questions? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank, thank you for mentioning that. So Monday and Wednesday of next week, I'm not going to be here. So we will not meet until Friday of next week. Okay? Everybody's smiling, but you still have homework due, and this homework's kind of big. So if you haven't started it, that's what I'd be doing Monday and Wednesday. So sound good? Let's do Wednesday, February 7th. No, we, don't, we we won't need to. We're we're doing good on time, but we got I got to get going, so <laughs> I got I got to get into it. So, everybody good? All right. Okay. So, let's talk about uh, concrete. Uh, let's talk about concrete beam behavior at the ultimate stage. So, I have my okay. This is a really important lecture, so I really want y'all to kind of pay attention to this. It's gonna kind of feel like movie time for a little bit, and I am going to break out the, uh, the C word, a little bit of calculus, but I don't think it's going to be uh, that bad. Okay, so up until now, what we've been doing is sort of in our heads, we've been conceptualizing and said, all right, we've got a concrete beam, let's take it and let's start ramping up the load. And we started out at these really light load levels and we said, okay, well, how much load will, take, uh, will cause the beam to experience cracking? So that was stage one from you know, a linear, pretty much linear behavior up until the cracking moment. But that's not it. The, the beam can still withstand load far beyond that. We can get to stage two where the beam is cracked, but it can still, res uh, uh, it, it can still re uh, resist load. If you all remember um, looking at the last example, I mean, that, you know, that steel was seeing something like 19,000 PSI, which is a lot of stress, but when you look at a steel's yield stress, of like 60,000 PSI, it's still nowhere near an, a beam's maximum ultimate capacity. So that's what we need to talk about now, stage three. It's absolute ultimate maximum capacity. We're talking about when the concrete starts to reach its FC prime, when the reinforcement starts to yield, and this beam is, is gone, it is done. So we need to talk about how we compute that. How do you assess a beam's ultimate capacity. And it's not as simple as just sigma equals my over i or something like that. We're going to introduce a little bit of a new approach. But I'm going to, I'm going to in a roundabout way, kind of explain uh, how we do that. Okay. Now, just so you remember, um, or just, just so you kind of see a, a first, uh, first off, I want you to see a couple things in this plot. So this is a plot looking at just a regular old uh, reinforced concrete beam. And if you were to go down to, uh, to the lab and, and test that thing to failure, this is about how it would respond. So, you know, here we're talking, you know, the, again, this very small load level until we reach the cracking moment. So you're looking at a plot of basically moment versus deflections. Deflections, in this plot, it's looking at, at, at slope, that, that how much it's rotating. Remember in structural analysis, we have slope and rotation. But whether you're looking at slope or deflection, you kind of get the, the same thing. So we have a very linear range until we experience that cracking moment. And there's usually a slight little jump there at the cracking moment. Because once you hit uh, the cracking moment, you know, it cracks and suddenly the, the steel starts to engage. But again, the, the, the beam can, can resist load far beyond that. The one point I want you to, to recognize, though, is that this curve is very nonlinear. 
Now, a lot of that sigma equals my over i stuff, we assume linear behavior. So how do we take those concepts that, that we've learned all throughout our undergraduate career and how do we apply it to real world, real life, concrete behavior? How, how do we do that? Okay. Well, I, I want to try and answer that question. I want to start off with something basic. Okay. So let's, let's go back to mechanics and materials. Okay, let's go back to mechanics and materials and let's see if we can ask ourselves um, how, how we can approach these types of problems a little differently. So I got here a beam. Okay, that beam is 12 inches wide, it's 20 inches tall. Okay, now I'm going to ask a basic question. Okay, how much moment is required to generate a bending stress of 8 KSI? Simple question. This is FE exam question if I've ever seen one. Okay, now. Let me show you how a mechanics of deformable bodies student would answer this question. So the flexure formula, sigma equals my over i, fundamental equation for, for bending. Take this equation and solve for moment. So multiply by i, divide by y, so moment equals sigma i over y, which this should be familiar already in here because what's a cracking moment? It's a modulus of rupture times ig divided by yt. It's the same thing, right? So we're, we're, look at the problem. We're determining the moment required to generate a bending stress of 8 KSI. So the stress, the sigma, is 8 KSI. The moment of inertia I, that's BH cubed over 12. Um, y is the, uh, the centroid distance from the centroid to the extreme tensile fiber. Plug and chug, and you get a moment of about 6,400 inch dips. Everybody okay with that? Now, now that is how a mechanics of deformable bodies student would answer this question. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you a different way of, of approaching this. Okay, another way of approaching this is to actually integrate the stress profile. And what I mean by that uh, is this. So you all remember sigma equals m y over i. Uh, we're talking about a, a bending stress profile that looks something like this, right? Okay, bless you. All right, so. We're talking about a bending stress of what we say, 8 KSI, right? So this dimension, if we're looking at this triangle, this is 8 KSI, right? That is 10 inches, right? So if I'm, so there's that. Let me also ask you this. This is a triangle, right? Where is the centroid of a triangle? H over 3 from the large end. So if we're talking about from the centroid, it's about here, and that's going to be 2 thirds of 10 inches, right? Sound good? Another thing we have to keep in mind, this bending stress profile, and man, this is really going to test my 3D art skills, but here's the beam. Okay, so the beam's sort of going like that, right? And the neutral axis sort of, you know, about here, right, about like that. This bending stress profile, it extends in three dimensions, right? It sort of, it sort of goes out like that, and it sort of goes out like that. You, you see what I mean? So, so, so it, you know, this, so imagine this, this, this uh, stress distribution coming out of the page. How, how, what is this dimension from here to here? 12 inches, right? That's how wide the beam is, right? So let's look at this from, from an integration perspective. I propose that another way of determining this moment is to say, all right, let's compute the area of this triangle, right? So the area is 1 half times 8 KSI times 10 inches, right? Then take that, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to take it. We're going to do three things to it. We're going to multiply it by 12 inches because it acts over the width of the beam. It acts over 12 inches, right? That's the first thing. Second thing that we're going to do, this is moment. So it's force times moment arm. So we're going to take this. We're going to multiply it by 12 inches. Then we're going to multiply it by a moment arm of 2 thirds of 10 inches, right? And the third thing that we're going to do is we're going to take that quantity and we're going to double it. And the reason why we're going to double it is because there's another triangle down here. And if you plug and chug, you will get the exact same number, 6,400. 
Let me try it out. See what happens. Make sense? Okay. This is a roundabout way of using the flexor formula in a, in a more graphical approach. Okay. Everybody okay with this? Any questions? All right. Now, here, here's the reason why I bring that up. The reason why I bring that up is because when we look at a concrete beam in its ultimate state, we do not have a nice, pretty, triangular distribution. It doesn't exist. Okay? Remember, what does the stress-strain curve for concrete look like? You know, if this is the strain, this is the stress, it looks something like that. It's rounded, right? So at its ultimate stage, that's where you're getting that sort of rounded behavior. That's just a stress-strain curve, right? And another thing, that's the stress-strain curve in compression. Why is there nothing about the concrete, like why is there no stress distribution in tension? Well, it's because the concrete's in tension, it's already cracked, right? This is nonlinear, okay? This is nonlinear. If, because this is nonlinear, theoretically, we have to break out some numerical method or calculus or something like that to integrate that stress profile. Now, I don't like breaking out calculus for every single engineering problem that I ever face, but I am going to break out a little bit of calculus to kind of explain how we go about this. Okay? This is theoretical in nature, but the idea is to kind of explain our approach and the way that we go about uh, uh, determining a beam's ultimate capacity. Everybody with me so far? Okay, so let's take this curve. Okay, now I took something simple. Okay, this is something easy. Uh, this is uh, y equals the square root of x. So you all break out your, your uh, uh, graphing calculators or Excel or whatever you want. You go graph y equals square root of x and it looks something like this. I wanted something simple. I sort of took like a fictitious stress distribution, sort of turned it on its side. But I have here a graph of y equals square root of x, and I've made my range simple from 0 to 1. Okay? So I've got this curve. I'm going to do something. Try and keep this simple. Okay? I want to calculate two things. I want to calculate the area under the curve, and I want to calculate the moment about this y-axis. And I'm doing that because I, I want to try and relate that to equilibrium, you know, forces and moments. Force being the area under the curve, moment being, you know, moment. Okay. So... How do I calculate the area under the curve? If I have the square root of x from 0 to 1, how do I do that? Integrate that from 0 to 1. Now, how would I calculate the moment about the, the, uh, the y-axis? Well, instead of integrating the function from 0 to 1, I integrate the function times the moment arm. And how far is it from the y-axis to the function? It's x. Okay. So what I have here is the area being the integral from a to b, or in this case from 0 to 1 of the square root of x, and this one being x times the square root of x from 0 to 1. Now, you all are experts in indefinite integrals. If not, you can break out the Casio FX115 ES plus, right? You all can do that. Um, and you can integrate this and plug and chug, and you are going to get that the area is 2 thirds and the moment is 2 fifths, okay? So I propose that this curve has an area of two-thirds, and I propose it has a moment of two-fifths. Okay? Now, here's what I'm getting at. Okay? My question is, I don't like dealing with calculus. I don't like doing it. Calculus, not, not, for, every single calcul or not for every single engineering challenge, I want to avoid it. My question is, can I come up with a box that'll do the same thing, that has an area of two-thirds, and a, mom or a moment of two-fifths, can I just create a box that does the same thing with some dimension y prime, some dimension x prime? Okay, why am I using a box? Because a box is simple. What's the area of the box? It's just that times that. What's the moment arm? Well, it's one minus x, bar or x prime over two. That, I, I can do that very easily. I don't need to break out the integrals or the calculus in order to do that. It's something simple. Can I come up with dimensions that, that, uh, that mimic this? The answer is yes, you can. So the area of that box, if I have, you know, symbolically, the area of that box is going to be x prime times y prime. The moment is going to be that area times 1 minus x prime over 2. 
And I say, okay, well, what do these values need to be such that the area comes out to be two-thirds and the moment comes out to be two-fifths? This is two equations, two unknowns. This is every algebra problem's fundamental. I mean, one of the fundamental challenges in algebra is to solve a series of equations. This is very, very, uh, very apropos. So plug and chug, and after you go through and grind it out and do the math, you find that if you have an x prime of four-fifths or 0 0.8, and you have a y prime of five six, comes out to be about like 0.83. Do the math, you'll find it has the same area and the same moment as that. So I propose that these two functions are sort of equivalent from a mechanic standpoint. They got the same area and they can, uh, contribute the same moment. Um, this is a whole lot easier to deal with for, from an engineer's perspective than this. Th th does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Yes. Uh, yes, you'll, you'll see why here in a second. B bear with me, bear with me. Um, everybody okay with this so far? Okay. So your question was why is the box over on the right as opposed to over on the left? The reason why is this, and j just, sort of, just sort of bear with me. Okay, what I am proposing is this, so this is our challenge. We're trying to represent this nonlinear stress distribution with something that's simple, with a simple, easy to understand, what, what I'm going to call a stress block, a, a box, something that, that, that's quite easy to, to compute. And I propose that we can uh, idealize that as this, okay? So you saw those numbers like 0.8 and 0.833. I want you to see some of these, uh, some of these numbers here for concrete are, are, are very similar, and uh, I, I want you to see where they're coming from. Now, so I propose that, that the model that you're seeing here, this is a model, it's called the Whitney Stress Block. Uh, it was developed back in the late 30s. It, we've been using it for a long time in reinforced concrete, and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. This is how we as engineers idealize the ultimate strength behavior uh, of concrete. So again, we've got a nonlinear distribution of, of, of stress, and I'm going to idealize that uh, as this. So I am proposing that the width of that stress block is always 0.85 uh, FC prime, okay? So if this, so from here to here, if this is FC prime, so think of this as kind of like that zero to one, I'm sort of squunching that in a little bit and spreading it out and saying that the, the width is 0.85 FC prime. Now the depth of that, new, of that stress block is something that we always call A. We're gonna uh, dig into this and delve into this later, but if you're wondering, like, what is A? Well, A is however deep the stress block needs to be in order to achieve equilibrium. And we're going to get into an example that, that defines that, so don't worry if that's a little hazy. Now, the question is, well, why was this box over here on the right and over here on the left? Well, uh, basically, a roundabout way of your asking is, why is this box up here as opposed to down here? And the reason why is even, you know, if you're, if you're trying to relate this to, to basic bending theory, the stresses and the strains are higher on the top than they are on the bottom. So that's why the box was shifted up as opposed to down. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with this? What do you mean? Well, the, the formulation would be different, but it wouldn't be as accurate and it wouldn't reflect what's really going on. Do, do, do you see what I mean? If I bend a beam, the stresses, hold, hold on. If I bend a beam, the stresses are higher on the top than they are lower. Do, do, do you see what I mean? Well, let's also keep in mind, I mean, this is a really complicated nonlinear behavior, and we're taking an empirical approach to idealize what's going on. Do, do you see what I mean? I mean, it, one of the classes I had in grad school was advanced concrete design. We, we went, in, or advanced concrete behavior, we went and numerically integrated this and spent weeks writing a program that would numerically integrate the stress profile, and you find that when the assignment's over, you're like, why did I spend, waste all my time doing this? Just use 0.85 FC prime. It actually works pretty well. So, does that make sense? Again, this is empirical, so it's, it's something you, you kind of got to be aware of. But again, it's it's try, it's it's based on real life mechanics. Yes, sir. Yes, the 0.85 is always a constant. Okay. What is variable is this term beta one. Okay, now we're going to dig into some of these specific terms later, so we'll explain what beta 1 is and all this stuff later. Beta 1 does depend on the concrete strength. 
But I'm, but this, I'm, I'm sort of taking like a walk before you can run approach. Like some of these provisions we're going to skip and then we're going to come back to later. So, so don't worry, we will explain that in detail here in a little bit. Sound good? Okay, yes. Yes, the 0.85 is not changing. That is always going to be 0.85. Okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The stresses down here are a little lower. I mean, you, there are there are some fundamental trends that are always going to be the same. I mean, there is still a neutral axis, and, and at that neutral axis, there's no stress. Even though it's nonlinear, that's going to be the case. You're you are still going to have lower stresses down here than you are up here. That that isn't changing. So, okay, sound good? All right. All right. I want to go through an example. Okay. So let me explain. We're going to take this example, we're going, to, we're going to do this example, and then we're going to come back to it and do some more intricate computations, uh, if you will. So, so, so again, just, just bear with me. We're going to take our time with this. Don't worry. I think a lot of these questions that you all are having, I mean, you're asking questions, but we haven't even done any examples on it. So let's, let's like do an example and let, let, let's see where we're at, okay? So I have a beam. Uh, it's uh, 10 inches wide. Okay, it has a depth of 23 inches. Okay, one of the things you'll notice I'm not, I didn't give you is H. I didn't give you the height of the beam. What you're going to find as we begin to progress throughout some of these uh, topics is that the actual overall height when it comes to a structural capacity standpoint doesn't really matter a whole lot. It actually is, is pretty easy to disregard. Uh, because that's the region, we're talking about the region that's experiencing tension and we disregard that concrete anyway. So we end up uh, neglecting it. All right. Now I have a beam, the, the concrete has 4,000 PSI uh, compressive strength. The steel is A615 grade 60. So we'll, we'll uh, look at that here in a second. Now this beam has three number eights and it has an area of steel. So if you have three number eight bars, you can calculate the area. You know, the area of those three circles added up is about 2.36 uh, square inches. Sound good? All right. So let's take our time with this. So. Ooh, every time. Oh, that it squinched it. There we go. That's good now. Okay. All right. So example five. Now. So a couple things I'm going to write out. So we know that FC prime is 4,000 PSI, which is 4 KSI. Okay. Now, I'm curious, what's FY? Did I give you FY? Here's the problem. Did I give you FY? Yes, I did. It's grade 60. Grade 60 steel means 60,000 PSI or 60 KSI. So just so you're aware, that, that's what that grade means. It means that that is what the yield strength of that, uh, that steel is. Sound good? Any questions? All right. Now, okay, so here's my concrete beam, okay? And right now, my first task is to sort of try and figure out what's going on with equilibrium. So, so just bear with me on a couple things. So first thing, I propose that somewhere in this beam, there's a neutral axis. We'll say this is the neutral axis, okay? So let's take a look at the stress profile, okay? So above that stress profile, the concrete is experiencing compression. So in real life, it's experiencing a nonlinear stress distribution, which looks something about like this. 
Something like that. Okay? Now, over here, right at this particular point, we're experiencing some level of, uh, of tension. Okay? So we got some, some amount of the beam experiencing compression, some amount of the beam, uh, the beam experiencing tension. I got nothing in the concrete experiencing compression because I'm assuming the whole thing is cracked. Okay? Now, I'm going to throw some terminology out at you just so you all are aware. Okay? Um, this dimension from the top of the beam to where the neutral axis is, we call that dimension C. Okay? Now, we're not going to use C for this part of the example, but when we go back to example 5B, we're going to come back and use C to do some, some uh, ACI check. So we're not going to use it now, but we will use it later. So if this is C, that would make this dimension what? Like symbolically, what would that make this? D minus C. Not too shabby, right? Straightforward. Okay. Now. I don't like nonlinear. I, I can't stand it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to idealize this as something I can uh, interpret. Okay? So I'm going to take this stress block and I'm going to idealize it, or this, this stress uh, distribution, and I'm going to idealize it as something like this. Okay. Now, we're going to state that this width is always 0.85 FC prime. And the depth of this stress block is something we're always going to call A. Okay. So the, again, remember like I, I had said earlier in the semester, like these symbols that I'm throwing at you, like I'm calling this A and calling this C and all that. I'm not doing this flippantly. These are going to be the symbols these are going to be the, the, the terms that we always use. Like that depth of that stress block is always going to be called little a. The, from the top to the neutral axis, always going to be called C. So, you know, just be aware of this. I'm slowly building up your, your collection uh, of these symbols. Okay? Now, and also, and just so everybody's clear, and we'll try and break out some 3D art here again. This stress block that we're talking about, we're talking about a stress block that kind of does this. You know, so that stress block is applied over that entire width of the beam. You, you see what I mean? Everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. And we still have this tensile force. Okay. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Now let's, let's take these forces and let's see if we can compute them. So I propose this is a beam, so it's going to experience some amount of compression and some amount of tension. Let's talk about the tension, okay? I'm going to make a blanket assumption right now and assume that the steel has yielded. It has reached Fy, okay? We will check that later, but for now, we're going to make that assumption. In fact, later on, you're going to see that for all reinforced concrete beams at their ultimate stage, the steel has to yield. So it, it's not a matter of an assumption later on you'll see. You have to ensure that it's going to happen. So if you remember the stress strain curve for steel, it's sort of like is linear and then it, it plateaus and, and, and we've got that yielding plateau. So, so for now, w this is what I'm going to do. If the steel has yielded, I am going to assume that the force, I mean, how do you calculate a force? You know, a stress times an area. I propose that that force is the area of steel times the yield stress. Okay? Does that make sense? Because if it's yielded, that means the stress equals Fy. And I have a, if I have a stress applied over an area, the force is stress times area. Sound good? Okay. Now, Let's see if you're paying attention to, to a couple things. Because if you understand that, now I'm going to quiz you on something. If that is the tensile stress, help me out, what, or the tensile force, 
What do you think would be the concrete compressive force, like the force in compression, like the total force? Then again, stress times area. So what's the stress? All right, so hold, hold on, hold on, hold on on that. He said 0.85 FC prime times A. Okay, so 0.85 FC prime, that's our stress. What's our area? You said A. A times B because it's applied over the width of the beam, right? So this force is 0.85 FC prime AB. Now, see where I drew this? See how I kind of drew it in the middle? It's a lot like what we did in structural analysis. I got a uniformly distributed load, so I'm going to collapse that into a single point load applied where? The centroid, and if from the top to the centroid, what is that? What is this? There we go. Does this make sense? Any questions on this? So let me ask you this. If the compressive force, and I draw that compressive force with those little lines on the C so I don't mix that up with the, uh, the neutral axis distance over here on the left. If this is 0.85, FC prime AB and the tensile force is AS FY. Help me out. What here do we not know right now? A, A right? Because what's FC prime? It's 4 KSI. What's B? Somebody else. It's 10 inches. What's AS? And, and FY, we know it's 60 KSI. So, so th the one thing we don't know is A, right? Okay, I propose that A is whatever dimension it's got to be in order to maintain equilibrium. So how do I maintain equilibrium? What does that mean? What, here's a C and here's a T. What's the deal with equilibrium? They have to equal each other, right? The force in compression has to equal the force in tension, otherwise your beam is running away from you. So I propose that C has to equal T. So therefore A, well here, let, let's write it out. So 0 0.85 FC prime AB equals ASFY. So therefore, A equals AS FY divided by 0 0.85 FC prime B. What do you think? Let's, let's plug and chug. So what's AS? It's 2.36 square inches. We have 60 KSI. 0 0.85, 4 KSI. Again, there's no square root, so we can use whatever units we want as long as we're consistent. And this is 10 inches. What does this come out to be? I'm actually going to move some stuff around because I'd actually like to have all this all in the same slide. I'm going to move that. 4.16 what? No, I mean like, is it 160? So 4.165 inches. Everybody okay with that? No, I just want to make sure everybody's got the same thing. So, and everybody's, I, when I'm in class, I almost like with some of these problems, I almost like to go to a little bit of precision. So when I say 4.165, everybody knows what I'm talking about. So, um, Everybody good so far? So, so I propose that that depth is what that stress block has got to be. That is the depth it's got to be in order to maintain C equals T. It's, that's what maintains equilibrium. Okay, But that's not what we're after here. We're after a moment arm or we're after a moment. So let's go back to basic statics. How do, what's the basic definition of a moment? Just simple. Force times distance. All right, remember, okay, so, so look at this. This almost looks like a force couple, right? I got a force going this way and a force going that way. So how do I determine the moment 
generated by two forces going in equal and opposite direction? The distance between them, right? So I propose that if you're trying to determine, so let's look at moment capacity or nominal moment. Moment is simply force times a moment arm. So let's look at our moment arm. How far is it between those two forces? I want to do it symbolically. What's the distance from here to here? Symbolically. Somebody else. Somebody else. Ah, you two are answering too much. When I come back, you two have to be quiet. I'm going to make somebody else talk. So D minus A over 2. Now, that's the moment arm. What's the force? Which one do I use, C or T? Bless you. Which one do I use? It doesn't matter, right? Why? Because they're the same. Now, ask lazy Dr. Michelson which one he's going to use, C or T. T, because that's two terms instead of four. I don't like multiplying that much. So I'll say C or T, but I'm going to use T. So I propose that for this beam, the nominal moment capacity is AS FY D minus A over 2. That's it. So plug and chug, we've got 2.36 square inches times 60 KSI times, what's D? 23 inches minus 4.165 over 2. What do we got? So, so, so 29.61 point what? Just one decimal. Nine. Now, what are the units? It's a moment. No, it's a moment. Inch kips. There you go. Inch times kips. All right. Now, I don't like moments in inch kips. I like foot kips. So how do I take this to foot kips? What do I do to it? Divide by 12. So what is this divided by 12? And we'll say two decimal places. It doesn't really matter. Or no, one. Let's just do one. 246.8 foot kips. Make sense? Bam. That is the maximum moment capacity. Okay. Now, let me explain just so everybody's aware. Do you remember cracking moments? We were getting like 20 for the cracking moment, 27 for the cracking moment, something like that, for a beam that was very similar to this. This beam can hold up about 250 foot kips in moment be before it's going to fail. Okay? Make sense? Any questions? What do y'all think? Is this difficult? Not too bad. Okay. I want to show you something. I want to show you something because this is something y'all going to need to work on. Okay? And then we're going to call it. I know, I know it's 1050, just bear with me, just bear with me. All right, so here is your homework. Hold on, pay attention, you got a minute, you got a minute. So here, so problem one and problem two are sort of like cracking moment problems. I, I, I believe those are cracking moment. Problem three is a transformed section problem. Now, watch this, so problem four is computing a nominal moment capacity, very similar to what we just did. But if you were paying attention today, then you should be able to do problem five. Okay? So problem five is deriving an expression for determining the moment capacity of that. So what happens if the beam has a different cross section? Okay? My hint for you is here's your stress block. So if you want a hint, what I would do is your stress block looks something kind of like this, and this is the region that it's 
you know, being applied. So if you want to hint, what I would do is first determine that dimension. We'll call it x. It doesn't really matter. But if you can determine that width, then you should be able to do the rest. Okay? Every variable on there is everything that you need to, to derive the, the uh, I want A and I want M in. That, that's what I'm after. Sound good? All right. You all have a lovely weekend and week. We'll see you on Friday.